Welcome to Rich Conversations. Today we're going to chat with Ken Ferguson, who's a visual story artist and also my roommate and creative partner on my children's book, Millie Moves to the Farm. In our apartment, we have conversations about art, storytelling, philosophy, all the time. So why not, why not have him on the show here? So it's, it's an honor to present Ken Ferguson. You can follow him at KJ Ferg Art. Let's begin. All right. So today should be a pretty fun episode. We have Ken Ferguson here, who's a visual storyteller, and he's also my roommate. So I thought we would have a conversation about some of the things we talk about on a daily basis. It's just a lot of fun. And we're going to talk about art, visual storytelling. We're going to, we're going to really get into it, animation. So here we are, Ken Ferguson. Hello. Thanks for having me. We also have our, our third roommate here, oh. and Jill, uh, Ken's dog, who... Uh, We'll see, see how he does. He loves attention, so we'll see how he does. My first question for you is, how did you get into art, specifically like animation and illustration? Hmm. Um, so um, my two older brothers both um, drew a lot um, when I was growing up, and, and uh, a lot of my favorite cartoon characters and stuff. And In fact, uh, my parents would let them draw on the walls in the basement because it was on the basement was unfinished. Uh, and so it was just nothing but drywall and stuff like that. So there was a lot of Ren and Stimpy and Animaniacs and, and uh, the Simpsons and stuff like that on the walls. They were just their own characters. Um, and uh, um, so I was just surrounded by that, I guess. And uh, But then at, at, certain, at a certain point, I was told because I was always asking for them to do me like art and stuff like that for Christmas and draw draw this character, draw that character, yeah. you know. Uh, but at, around third grade, um, if I remember correctly, I was told to do it myself. You know, finally. And so, so little brother is like wanted all this art, and they were like, "You got to do it yourself." Mm. <laughs> Pretty much, uh, and. Uh, yeah, and then from then, I mean, I but I always drew though too, but mm -hmm. you know, it was never as good as theirs. But um, but I wasn't also putting in all the time and stuff because you know at that time I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, but yeah, you know, exposed to like Batman the animated series, which came out in 1992, uh, and I was born 1990. You know, so that was like that and like gargoyles and and. Uh, you know, all those little Disney um, animated uh, TV shows were what I was, like, kind of first exposed to. Um, and I had, and my older brothers were watching those things. So I don't think if it was just me <laughs> as a kid, I would be yeah. watching, watching that. But, you know, I think because... Uh, my older brothers were most likely in charge of watching us most of the time when my parents are away at work or something like that, like during the summer or something. That you know, the, those were the things that we what or like those were the things that we watched. You know. So how'd you end up in Chicago? Um. Well, uh, my journey began obviously in Iowa. The quest. Yes, the quest. Ken Ferguson <laughs> quest. Um, and when I turned 18 I moved to Minneapolis uh, where I went to art school the art institute um, it's no longer around um, <laughs> and uh, when I graduated I got a full time as a graphic designer which wasn't even what I went to school for but like you know I'm just like I'm an artist I can do whatever but I was just afraid to like dive into that that uh, realm yeah. you know i didn't feel like i learned enough or would learn anything to be able to hang you know and in, in a professional setting doing animation uh so i went this graphic design route because it was just seemed easier uh many who i left that job moved back to iowa uh and i was gonna quit doing art um because i didn't know what i was 
where I was going or what I was trying to do with it. I wasted all this time and money at this school, you know. I mean, I knew I could do it, but I just, like, I just like to draw, you know. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily for someone else. Um, and I hadn't quite grasped how I can make money doing it. Um, anywho, yeah, I guess towards the end of that one year in Iowa, a friend asked if I could do a portrait of um, – Sam and Dean from Supernatural and then a portrait of their daughter um, and I was like yeah <laughs> and I thought to myself if I can do this then I'm moving to Chicago I, already, I, I was already making plans to move to Chicago but like I'm going to be doing this like it Chicago. would give you more confidence to for that move right yeah. um well you know my brothers are here or we're, we're here um and uh in you know i i figure i'd be just you know doing whatever it is that they're doing which they were doing art you know um i was ex i was hoping to be like mentored or something but mm -hmm. so yeah i did these portraits and uh in the beginning they uh they liked it, um, but then about two years later, I found out that they actually <laughs> didn't. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, uh, you know, is there such thing as a good lie? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, what's uh, what's been your experience in Chicago then? Uh, so, um, my Chicago experience as. I, I suppose, you know, it's been good, you know, if I were just to, to label it with one word. Um, but, um, you know, I hit the, I came here and started doing stuff right away, work, work with my brothers because they were already doing it. Uh, you know, I did like a mural at a gym painting the, the gym, the owner's logo on the gym walls, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and... And uh, I did a mural uh, that they stuck on the side of Whole Foods in Inglewood. Uh, I wonder if it's still there. I haven't seen it since it went up. Um, uh, and uh, I did a mural in a guy's house on a ceiling. I painted clouds on a ceiling. That's pretty cool. Uh, That's pretty cool. Uh, I, one of these days I want to go out and, and uh, take a look at it again. I haven't seen it in like three years. Um, yeah, so I started doing, like, mural work, filming a lot, um, and then, you know, I started doing, like, little illustrations and started to get back into illustrating and stuff like that for people around. But Chicago, uh, you know, allowed me to learn fast by failing more often mm -hmm. and faster so that I could make all these, like, little adjustments um, and just, like, learn the business in general because I really didn't know, but I, you know, and then researching – and there's 101 ways to do yeah. things, you know, there's never, it's not actually like just one way to do something. So you find, you read all the stuff and then you, you know, whatever, whatever you remember, I suppose, is what you run with yeah. <laughs> after reading all these notes. Um, so my experience, like I said, has been good. Uh, it's, it's definitely been like on a, uh, you know, vertical trajectory. Uh, even during COVID, in fact, mm -hmm. like COVID, it just like went like accelerated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, we don't have the bar anymore, um, and so field test is over. You know, it's the real deal. Uh, and you know, now I'm just stuck at the computer, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which isn't a bad thing all the time. I like that though. Like, like the uh, the bigger the city, the more just like opportunities to to learn fail but fail quickly so you yeah. can keep learning and, yeah. and keep adjusting mm -hmm. yeah yeah so now you know i have like a reason for the pricing that i do because you know something i thought was thinking it will take me uh you know a couple days you know um turns out it takes a couple months uh, mm -hmm. you know i'm learning these things because there was a time when nothing else mattered and I was free to just do stuff and then I could just do it from start to finish dinner will be on breakfast lunch and dinner will would arrive at some point because of mom you know I had no responsibility yeah you're out here being an adult now yeah so <laughs> now it's like you know I had to like reevaluate 
my timelines because mm-hmm. um, life, you know, yeah. like I only have this many hours to do this and then I got to go to the bar and then girlfriends or just relationships in general and trying to maintain all that mm-hmm. stuff, you know, and some of them hate what you do because you spend so much time doing it and because they, they don't understand it and you can't, yeah. you can't explain it to them, but yet they love Disney movies and, and you're like, you know, that took... 10 years to make right 10 years yeah. you know uh you you just seen the end result you know yeah. of all the mistakes that they made and they corrected it and and then they made this yeah that seems to know. be a common theme throughout life is that people look at the outcomes rather than the process that it took to to get there you're right yeah. um you know and it's about the journey not the destination so speak speaking of that <laughs> so ken about a year and a half ago he he told me the difference between Eastern and Western storytelling, and it just has stuck with me. And it's actually like transformed how I view the world and how I do things. And it's it's incredible to me. So if you could elaborate on the difference between the two, yes. Um, so Western storytelling is a lot about or more about the individual. So for example, the Iliad or or the Odyssey, um, you have. Odysseus who leaves with thousands of nameless men and when at the end of his journey he returns alone he's like this last man standing whereas like eastern storytelling um you have like a, a single man that sets out on a journey and he meets people along the way that uh, assist and become like partners and allies throughout his journey to to the end goal um and that's it. That's pretty much that in a nutshell. Uh, Journey to the West, I guess I didn't say that. Yeah. yeah. What, I, what I love about it is like, you know, for, for a lot of my life, it is like, you know, we have this American dream and, you know, I'm going to go after it. I'm going to, you know, hustle. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do me. I'm mm-hmm. going gonna, gonna to achieve this. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's also very stressful and exhausting. And it's... Um, Let's say fear creeps in because you're always trying to protect your dream or what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But the opposite, where you have this maybe goal or this dream in mind, and you're open, and you just meet people along the way, and yeah. you see what they can do, and mm-hmm. you become friends with them, and it's like you're doing it together, mm-hmm. and everybody has their own goals and stuff, and you hope to meet great people that are that have core values you can identify with and you're just going on this quest together and it's yeah, more fun right. and it's collective yes. and mm-hmm. it's uh it's the journey the journey indeed yes um yeah I, I mean you you nailed it i don't really have much to follow up with that you know it's just what i've been on i guess i guess the the, the great point or the great parts is that you know we can pick and choose who we work with you know Mm -hmm. um and that's that's kind of been like the best part about what i do is i i i'm not being forced to work with this person or that person is it like kind of comes down to if i believe in their project and their vision then Mm -hmm. you know then i'll work with you and be open to work with whomever wherever so that you learn more you Mm -hmm. know so like being more open to the world means like you're accepting different cultures and and different ideas you know instead of like hating someone that chose to vote a certain way um which is like their you know right to do um you you try to understand why you know everyone votes in in what they think is in their best interest um and what's going to suit them the best you know so so we could see in America how we we're talking about this Western kind of approach, how like people in their political views believe them to be right. So it's kind of like this fight. They, they want to fight because they're on this hero journey mm-hmm. where they're going to be the last one standing to win the argument and to prove themselves. Right. There's no uh, death to ego. Um, it's like all there is is ego at this point and I don't, I don't want to be wrong. 
Well, like I'm not wrong. That's the problem. Yeah, it's not yeah. even, there's not even thought of like I don't want to be wrong. He's like I am not wrong. You yeah. know, and, and I'm I'm gonna filibuster you until you give up. And yeah. Because because you, wear you down. Yeah, you know, and because you gave up, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you you're wrong. You know. And, yeah. Um, you, these are the kind of things that I would learn in in anime watching that stuff. You know, it's like there's characters that believe in the survival of the fittest, you know, and strong live and the weak die. But then we have these um, opposing characters that say the weak, even though, even though that may be necessarily true, the weak doesn't don't, the weak doesn't have to die if we, you know, lend them a hand and protect them and, and just like work together as a as a collective or like mm-hmm. a unit or, um, and uh and then they also these these opposing forces that believe in that that strong live and the weak die um also believe that because they won they're right yeah you know but that's not a good way of thinking but that's how we think now it's like because you back down or because you know you just or because you killed this person that opposed you you're right they're wrong you know yeah. type of type of added like type of thinking that just doesn't uh just doesn't breathe life it just brings nothing but yeah hate and destruction <laughs> so so yeah i would say to summarize that my my experience over the last year and a half especially just by taking on this more eastern storytelling approach and applying it to my own life it's been a lot more enjoyable. Right on, man. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers to that. Cheers to that with our, our coffee, yeah. Dink. Something I know you've been working on, you've got a couple different projects, Ken, here. Uh, one, he's got a music video, and he's on a children's book. He's got a lot of things going on. And something that was interesting, interesting to me, what you said about, like, the children's book is how, like, color doesn't exist. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've been learning that um i have to like turn off my brain when it comes to the art that i do um i work in all all different mediums you know from you know physical acrylic paints and stuff like that to digital painting and um and actually you know now that i'm thinking about this like my i never liked color uh always because color at the end of the day can uh, make or break your image, you know, no matter how dope the, the black and white drawing was. But um, I've learned through my studies so far, especially working with this book, um, that, you know, it's not about it's not about the color in which we see blue, yellow, red. You know, it's about the value, uh, meaning light and dark, you know, uh, dark um imitates things that are embossed or or underneath in, in the shadows you know um, it gives um, depth to an image and and then the lighter the value is then uh, that's like it's something on the surface you know uh, and on the outside so then that's how you're able to develop like a form or like a you know you make a circle and then you turn mm-hmm. it into a sphere you know, that has this illusion of dimension because it goes from light to dark. And if you look at things in that in that perspective, value, then then you can use any color as long as the colors are on the, the scale of value, light and dark. On the scale of light and dark, then you can use any color, you know. I'm going to use this dark red over here and this light blue over here, you know, and... and and the colors like all come together and blend together and you get the same results. <laughs> so it's probably best to always work in like a monochromatic, you know, color scheme in mm-hmm. a way, you know, especially if you're trying to set a mood, you know. Yeah, set the mood. Yeah. <laughs> so what are what are some of your favorite um, cartoons and anime? Hmm. Um, so right now I'm watching Attack on Titan, but we won't get into that one. Um, Avatar The Last Airbender uh, is definitely like a recommended watch. Uh, maybe we can do that. Uh, there's three seasons of that. Um, yeah, but maybe we can do like 24-minute 24 24 episodes. 
Uh, maybe we can do that in the future. Um, but, you know, these are things that, like, I still watch today that, like, influences. Or, well, when I watch cartoons, like, I'm not watching cartoons anymore. Like, I'm not watching it like you would watch it. Like you're so wa- how do you watch it? Uh, so you, I'm sure you and your audience are familiar with The Matrix and that uh, once, yeah. once Neo, you know, started to believe that he was who who they said he was the way he seen seen things was different he didn't see the agents you know the glasses and the suits anymore he saw the code mm-hmm. you know all the all the code binary code you know that's how he's seen everything and so when i see when i'm looking at cartoons that's how i see it you know i see everything all the work that went into it i see the layers i see you know the decisions yeah um I even see mistakes that were overlooked, you know, that made it into the the final product that, you know, wasn't intentional, but, you know, an untrained eye wouldn't have caught it, you know, unless they watched it like over and over and over and over again. And it was like looking specifically for those things. Um, So when I'm watching cartoons, I'm seeing the code uh, on what... when So you're in the Matrix. Essentially, yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So... Uh, like I, I'm, I have to be able to look at something, blow it apart, you know, piece by piece, mm. and and like reconstruct it back together, um, in my own work, you know. So, um, so Avatar: The Last Airbender actually um, helped me figure out how I was going to do my color for this for the children's book because the issue is the the main character he's gray, and gray. Is not a real color, <laughs> you know. If we're if if color is actually a thing, you know, uh, I mean, I know it's kind of racist to say I don't see color, but you know, but you know, it's not color. It's value. It's value. <laughs> it's value. Yeah. You know, some people are darker value than others. Yeah. You know, um, and so I'm watching Avatar. And I'm noticing that like whatever mood that they're trying to set, that's the color that overtakes everything so so because gray is is this like neutral color or like this it's like this in between that like doesn't exist um it takes on whatever color it is next to um so there's a lot of paintings especially when you go to art institute maybe the next time look at them a little deeper and see how much gray is actually in the image okay um because there i'm sure you'd see quite a bit of gray uh, spots you know but mm-hmm. um whenever it even tricks the computer like if you put a gray square next to like a blue square then this gray will seem like it has like this blue it, it seemed like this like blue gray you know yeah uh and it, it even tricks the computer into thinking that it's a blue gray you know <laughs> so it's like pretty interesting how it works so uh, so, so because gray is this neutral color and it takes on whatever color it's next to or whatever the dominant, uh, source of light and Ed's color is, that is what I have to do to the character because he's gray. Mm-hmm. Um, he takes on whatever color is, is in the atmosphere. Uh, so then you have to pay more attention to that and what's around uh not not like necessarily well kind of but you know um you should always set up your lighting and stuff first i, I learned that in, uh in school and i never understood how can you set up your lighting and your cameras if you don't have your characters there but but you make little um placeholders you know mm-hmm. all right this guy's gonna be here this guy's gonna be there camera's gonna be here you know, all right, light's going to be coming from this direction. And yeah. so once you set that kind of stuff up, then then you're able to um, have better direction on where you're going to go. So, for instance, there's a sunset scene uh, that's got some reds and blues, oranges, and uh, but the, the highest saturated contrast in color is the, the lighter value of this orange-yellow color. And so that is what is that's the source of light, mm-hmm. and so that is what the dominant color is, and and as we get to the shadow side, the darker value side, um, it takes on some of those darker colors like the blues, 
and darker reds and stuff like that. It's all about warm and cool, warm and cool, yeah, light and so dark. You, yeah. So it allows you to see these cartoons in totally different ways than yes, the average yep, person. Yep. What about like, um, I know you've, you've told me uh, you've been influenced by the Berserk comics or oh the yeah graphic novels the graphic oh well the, a few the, different graphic novels um yes uh you know i wish i owned berserk but um that one is still going on but that one's such a deep 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 um i mean it's been going on since like 85 okay. still not finished yet but since covid uh, which is hilarious because the the creator uh kentaro me uh Kentaro Miura or something like that, I can't remember. He uh, was going to take a hiatus, nine-year hiatus uh, <laughs> to be exact. Uh, and then COVID happened, and then he started busting out. I think he did about th uh, three or four chapters last year, and then and then he just completed another chapter that was released um, earlier this month. Um, you know, so like the fans are happy because yeah. he's, he's taken these like big hiatuses mm -hmm. often. Um, would in like making readers wait four or five years, but he'll take on other projects, which is cool. And then he comes back to Berserk, and then the project that he worked on, you know, in his in his um off or in his hiatus mo time, you know, whatever, however you say that, he it influences the work. Yeah. moving forward in the story you know and i think he takes these hiatuses to because he's moving into like a different scene and stuff like that in the in the stories so like you know he there's a this arc called fantasia arc but they're in this like mystical elf like realm or like witches and elves and all these like mystical um mythical creatures like live and it's like a good place and uh and when he before he even created that, he took this huge hiatus, and he worked on another story that dealt with like fantasy. Um, oh, so it was kind of and okay. and then and, and, and you know, and then he came back, and then he like had this like very whimsical like style that he incorporated in yeah. without while maintaining the the integrity of the, the original characters that have been in the story yeah you know um it's it's fun to look at uh, a manga especially not, not 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 a manga being is um a japanese comic book um all the western stuff these guys the people that make them highly trained to draw a certain way it's like hype semi-real you know kind of not really but like close enough on the realism side um to be like you know like a chin scratcher like dang man they went in on this yeah. but but then enough to have this like you know loose abstract cartoon aesthetic but they're all kind of like just trained the same way okay. here whereas like uh um an individual it's actually funny because then an like that is a system is all collective here in the west you know mm -hmm. to make these produce these everybody's got to look like work and draw the same um essentially but in japan you know this individual can try out his hand at being uh, they call him a mangaka or something like that um uh, but just a manga manga artist uh and uh you know and try and try and try again uh until like you know something gets accepted um as an individual and a lot of times you know it's just the individual working on these projects but it's fun to see because you can see these in, in manga where the artist started you know they, they started this story yeah. got picked up they still weren't quite sure where they were going with it you know the the, the character designs are you know pretty rough um, but then they, uh, after working on it, you see the evolution of the design ever so slightly. Um, and then you would compare like their last book to like their first book. And then like, and it's see, just like so different. Yeah. Like, I mean, the character, they still kept the integrity of the character. It just looks different. Yes. Like yeah. it looks like 
the vision is clear, I guess, you know. Oh, that's These are like, cool. you know, rough rough drawings. Like, I'm not quite sure how this character, well, they know what this character looks like, mm -hmm. but because they were doing it over and over and over again, they, like, perfected the character, yeah. I guess, you know. Um, but Berserk is a big one, and uh, I think everyone should check it out if you can. Berserk. Um, it's a rough story. I mean, it deals with... Um, death i mean it's like based in medieval time mm -hmm. um you know uh just like the nastiness of men uh, just men meaning people in general mankind um you know it's war mercenaries kings and queens and and all these it's like all this stuff and it's just like these characters trying to you know figure out their path in, yeah. in, in this all all in this in this you know this godless earth you know it seems yeah. like you know so uh you know not necessarily game of thrones -y, but um, like its own world it's own yeah, yeah. i mean it you based off of some of the landmarks and stuff that pop up in the story it's it is based in in on earth on like our earth um um but in a different time i guess yeah so so something that's been interesting is in our apartment, we're in my bedroom right now recording this, but outside in the living room, Ken has his animation station set up. And so he has, he has like, it's called a Cintiq where he does his drawing and stuff. And he's also got a TV, which he, he, he likes noise in the background when he's creating. So he has this, he has this, uh, this website on that just plays like random, cartoons and movies and it's so interesting how during covid the time feels so dark and you know uh, there's so much confusion and and uh desperation in a way but here inside this space it's very playful and it's inspiring and optimistic and hopeful because we have this nostalgic going on and we're working both on our crafts and uh and we're good friends it was just it's like a different world here talk about that website and like the, the things that come up uh so i discovered this website and probably you know like midway through my freshman year of college i don't even know what i was looking for or how i even found it yeah i, don't, I couldn't i can't recall like i may have even found the app like an app first and then um and then went in and from the app but I'm pretty sure it's created by the same guys that that created Twitch. Okay. Um, and it, and it used to be called Justin TV, and they had like an app where you can and like people could stream and and had all these channels. Um, and there was one that was just always just doing Dragon Ball Z on this app that I had on my phone. Uh, but somehow I found this website. Yeah, called Tanami Aftermath. If anybody, if anybody's you know listening is familiar with Tanami, you know, anime block after school, you know, you get off the bus and you run home. Gotta, yeah. get, gotta get Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> yeah. gotta, gotta get home for Dragon Ball Z. You know, and um, so I yeah I, I play that. Um, well, I've been watching this website since since I discovered it, uh, and and it's. You know, just been good to me. Uh, but I, I play it because it takes me back to that time of mm -hmm. running home to catch Dragon Ball Z um, and just having like no real responsibilities. Like I, I'm, I'm more aware of like the time that I had then now than I than I was then. You know, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, like, and so like it takes me back to like this time just you know it gives me all these feels and stuff like that while i'm working and it makes me feel good you know and 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 a lot of what i do requires that i feel good you know mm -hmm. uh, because if i don't then i'm like judging everything that i do yeah. where where i don't want to be judging you know you want to so. be feeling free when you're creating exactly yeah. um and so that brings me listening to it. I, I hardly watch it. I mean, I've seen all these episodes for the most part. Uh, although I do get to catch things that I hadn't seen before, um, you know, things that I might have missed due to sports and episodes of Dragon Ball Z and stuff like that, uh, or other cartoons that I've never seen before that they 
they play or movies that I've never seen before that they play. Um, and uh, it just takes me back to that time, like I said, of like being free to do, just free to do, yeah. you know. Um, and then every, you know, also when I'm like struggling um, in creating, I can, you know, rotate myself and then like watch you know something and then i'll yeah. you know something and there might and then you're plugged into the matrix and you can yeah, see something <laughs> something comes out you know that might help me you know develop yeah. what i'm doing you know or, or just you know relax me yeah uh either way like good comes from it but you know all the old mcdonald's cartoon or commercials yeah. and the coca-cola uh snow polar bears and you know all that stuff like that so that's good stuff. well what's interesting too is like like I'll just be sitting there and then I'll, I'll pay attention to what's going on, not necessarily watching it. And I haven't seen uh, Dragon Ball Z or some of these other ones that are on, but they're, they're like some of them are really philosophical and deep. And yeah. it's like these are children's programs. Right. We, we talk about how, um, you know, cartoons deal with uh, war a lot, you know. Yeah. And, and so, uh, I mean, I, I, of course, there's always like, you know, one force opposing another force it seems like um or at least it used to be i don't know i i don't re i don't feel like any of the cartoons these days reflect that at all but yeah you, you know it's this organization against this organization or this team against that team there is a defining factor on who's the enemy and who's not yeah um and uh um, and the, yeah, of course, like it dealt with war mostly. Avatar, mm -hmm. Last Airbender, that's, that's war. Dragon Ball Z, you know, it's always some invader coming in and trying to, you know, destroy. You know, that's war. Powerpuff Girls, you know, invader. Yeah. There's all all these like invaders, <laughs> yeah. you know. So well, I, they they talk about that stuff too, but also like friendship and yes. Like, uh, meaning in life in a way and Definitely. doing good and, yes, uh, yeah. and so it's always like this collective coming together to go against like this opposing force or, yeah. or you know this collective is like the only people that have like optimistic hope mm -hmm. for the future and, and, and in their abilities and stuff like that you know and, um, and they take action against all these opposing forces you know but they also have like superpowers usually to assist them on their journey <laughs> <laughs> that tends that tends to help a lot yeah. yeah i mean i suppose like you know um whatever your skill is whether you be a singer or a writer or an illustrator that is a superpower and yeah. we're all able to use you know what we do as as a as a force you know yeah and then going back again to the the Eastern storytelling you were talking about, if we all have these superpowers or skills, mm -hmm. how do we come together to combine those skills and right. do something worthwhile? Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we have to align that vision up, you know, mm -hmm. common goals and whatnot. Uh, one of the things I do have ran into, or used to run into a lot, um, when it came to working with other people is that, like, they don't want to abandon no like no one wants to abandon their visions that they had originally for themselves and they don't want to stop working on their vision mm -hmm. in order to work with someone else and so the, the willingness for someone to take their small fire and throw it into the biggest fire you know and ride that for a while i think in order for one to do that, you know, they're, they they have to be going in somewhat of the same direction, mm -hmm. um, which kind of leads into like just being able to collaborate, meet people, networking. Networking has always been the thing. Um, that's always what has worked for me. I, I haven't had a website in in over five years, um, and every time I finish a project. I get like all these referrals and other people reaching out for to, for me to do the same thing mm -hmm. and all that stuff like that, you know. So like me 
I have this dream of just doing art in general and, you know, and just so happen to get paid for doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I and then I meet these people who have these visions and they can't um, but they can't do what I do and they don't have time to learn it for themselves. So I take my fire, my skill mm -hmm. and um, and I cast it in what seems to be the biggest, which is probably coming from the visionary who is going to do the other end of like putting things together and turning it into something. Yeah. So I put my skills in that fire to create something, you know, and then when it's over, you know, they, they're, they're going in a direction that I'm trying to head in. I like to do books, illustration. I like to do illustration, you know, in general or, or animations, whatever mm -hmm. art. I just like to do art, uh, and I just so happen to get paid to do so. Um, and and so I'm able to like put my my fire in that fire, and then take it out when it's over. Yeah. And not even not necessarily take it out, but you know started. But it probably allows your fire to grow larger. Too. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because then I get these referrals, and and it's still. What's impressive too is that. Like you don't have a website yet, yeah. but yet you're still getting all these referrals yes. and word of mouth. Yeah, word of mouth is definitely, I think, still the the best um, way of of getting work yeah, because absolutely. because you know these are people being referred to from other people that were satisfied with your service, mm -hmm. you know, instead of like throwing this fishing net out on the internet and trying to catch. Uh, you know yeah. people yeah. like trying to appeal to people mm -hmm. and that you know honestly that's just something I was, I've just never been about like I don't stunt or whatever you want to call it or show off I mean there's moments of course peacocking for a girl or something but <laughs> <laughs> but like you know as far as like being me in general like I don't I don't see it necessary to like dance yeah. you know for people uh, and um, and it's like if you want to work with me then like let's figure out something and if not then like then, then yeah then i guess not you know and i'm not butthurt about it or whatever but um you know people are throwing out this like wide net to catch many fish and i'm just still using that single line yeah. <laughs> you know with, uh, just in the water you know so i feel like just now i'm, I'm thinking of like a old man in a Japanese cartoon is just like simply put his line out in the water. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's you know, it's really. Uh, I I think I heard in a cartoon it's like he's saying you know, uh, the struggle between fish and man is like a lifelong, like journey, and it takes like patience and and but I, I guess it's just like a, a a long drawn out mini word way of just saying like, you know, just that pa fishing mm -hmm. takes patience. Um, and, um, just because you, you're sitting, it's just because you're not catching fish doesn't mean you're not trying to fish, you know? And I heard it's about the journey too. Right. Exactly. It which patience. Yeah. Which I heard that from Matt Bones, one of your guests. You heard that from Sammy and Matt Bones. Yeah. That was something they, they, uh, kind of threw on me when I was working on, on projects with them. Um, you know, just cause, just cause you, you're fishing and not catching fish doesn't mean you're not trying to fish, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's, it's just something that you can't, you can't dive into the, well, I mean, you can, but you can't dive into the water and just start trying to catch fish with your bare hands and teeth. You yeah. know, um, that's something, oh, that's so fitting too. Cause, uh, so Sammy and, and Matt Bones are in bone lane and, uh, a lot of their symbolism that they use is a fish hook and fish. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I wonder how much of that pertains to just that idea of catching fish, yeah. you know, or like, you know, trying to create, you know, just because, you, you know, we're buddies and we're hanging out mm -hmm. and bouncing ideas off the wall, but like no one's seeing anything visually. An outsider would think we're just dicking around and wasting mm -hmm. time. But in fact, we're in the sandbox, essentially and yeah. you're creating verbally you know before starting to like produce you know things yeah. on paper you know so something i think about too is um 
how I'm always learning and I'm always like looking, observing. Mm-hmm. So when I walk down the street, I feel like I'm working because I'm observing yeah. the people, mm-hmm. the buildings, mm-hmm. traffic. Mm-hmm. Everything is telling me something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then applying that to the work that I do or whatever project I'm working on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, when I, when I'm seeing, when I'm out and I'm out looking, like I can't turn it off anyway, but you know, I'm, when I see buildings, I see cubed rectangles and, and yeah, all you know, the all the shapes and, yeah. and stuff like that. Or I like, you know, this clothing style or what, you know, and, and these are all things that I incorporate into my work. You know, I got to, st- I study everything that, you know, I've, I just have not yet gone as far as like tasting things like you know yeah uh outside of like actual food you know yeah uh, like trying to get more of a sense of what is this and what makes up this thing you know yeah go look a a brick (laughs) i I want a a cartoon that i was watching uh, that featured like a a manga artist he like killed like the spider and then like was like tasting it and you know and so they say you can get like a better sense of like the spider, you know, yeah. uh, but interesting. I, so I, I have yet to like explore that, but I, I, I wonder <laughs> yeah, for you sure. Know, what, you know, how far do I go? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you can't, you know, one of your senses is just your eyes. Um, but as a visual storyteller, you have to, you know, visually incorporate sound without like always like making the sounds whoosh you know mm-hmm. type stuff but like adding motion into the illustration even though it's not moving which then you know subliminally creates a sound in the viewer's ear yeah you know what would you say the role of visual storytelling is in society um well originally i believe it was probably just to uh um tell lessons may you know morals um give some people like a broader view of like the consequences for their actions um you know um, maybe they tell i mean it's it's been used forever from caveman to to now i mean even so this thing was used in caves and now it's used in an iPhone ad in the yeah, street or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and in, you know, it's visual storytelling is very minimal, whether it be, you know, a guy, a hand holding up the new iPhone or like a full on like Gilgamesh, like scribe, you know, being told, but like, you know, I, I imagine that like before, People would go to war, like you're being told about, you know, um, some ca- some some guy that defeated a hundred men, you know, mm-hmm. by himself or something like that, to, yeah. you know, or, you know, whatever to, to to get the guys like, you know, pumped up and. Or even when you think about like the Uncle Sam ad, I want you. Yeah, yeah, that's you know. visual storytelling, isn't Definitely, it? Definitely, you know, it's like your country is is like want is it needs you or wants you uh, to enlist but it almost feels threatening a little bit <laughs> uh, <laughs> may, I maybe maybe you know maybe not back then but now yeah. more so now than anything you know it's like then we we have such distaste for uncle sam um uh and uh, he's been painted in a in a like very um over time he's evolved yeah. into like this enemy i suppose of the of the public well it's interesting too how you can have societies throughout history valuing one thing and then later on the society doesn't value that so what you have left is kind of like this timeline through art mm-hmm. of like what people thought and mm-hmm. believed yeah. and what they wanted yeah. and yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, things are being recycled. We're in this, like, recycle era of, of, of production where we're taking these symbols 
and these images and turning them into or modernizing them i think at the end of the day you know yeah. now now uncle sam is like a pothead and not you know this like flag bearing mm -hmm. you know fourth of july looking you know white man he's not just a white man he's a high white man you know now and it's like <laughs> You know, pot leaf, you know, all 60s out, you know. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. A lot a lot of things. I can't even think of anything off the top of my head, but, you know, things are turning into memes. Um, and we're re recreating the, the meaning of these symbols and stuff like that, you know. Um, so we're using art to reimagine past art and past messages mm -hmm. and communication yeah and just repurposing them in a different way now yeah which you know it there you know i don't think any of these things are inherently good or bad but uh they can you be used to to uh to erase the original meaning of something you know imagine if they like erased the original meaning of the confederate flag somehow um and people or, or they just like revamped it somehow maybe change the colors like what the, what have you seen a rainbow confederate flag <laughs> <laughs> you know and like what would people think you know yeah uh they wouldn't know what to think <laughs> so, i don't know yeah um because it did it changes its whole meaning because yeah. then i was like well what are you yeah. You know, and it's like I'm gay and I'm proud and I love to be white. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and, and that's a, an oxymoron, I suppose. But I'd like to see that. Yeah. Well, you can use art to communicate and express who you are, what you believe. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So it it takes on art. You know, it's not just a job of someone. It's like something so much bigger that it can contribute to. Definitely, you know. And a quote from Stan Lee, which was, with, with great power comes great responsibility. And which is true because art, visual storytelling can turn into propaganda, it, but propaganda isn't necessarily good or bad, mm -hmm. um, but like, you know, it's always the art that motivates people to do whatever it is that they're being asked or called to do. Um, and drawing a blank, but you know, that's, that, that's just what it's been all through history at the end of the day, you know, it's when a civilization is combed over due to, due to time when, when the next civilization building, you know, creates, they find what's yeah. the art that's like, I mean, even what you see. Behind. A lot of times in my free time, I'll watch history documentaries mm -hmm. about like civilizations and stuff. Yeah. And when someone's being conquered, or when when one civilization or group conquers another, they basically wipe out all the art. Because mm -hmm. that art stands for something and it has meaning. Right. You can just wipe it out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even that that kind of stuff is even in in. Uh... The Bible, like in Deuteronomy, you know, God calls them to, um, you know, when you take over this, take this land, destroy all everything. Their statues, their 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 gods, uh, like scrape the names off and mm -hmm. like destroy them. You know, to destroy like all that stuff. You know, um, and don't ponder on how what it was used for, or how they chose to worship their gods you know in what way like it's like you know don't even look at it just toss it in the fire yeah. you know because things are appealing uh to the eye i guess yeah isn't that interesting how art can have that power yeah i suppose that's uh that's not necessarily like well that is because i, I mean I, I i just always wanted to like give back to the world i mean i embarked on this journey because I learned so much from cartoons. Mm -hmm. Like I learned how to dance from cartoons, for at the very yeah. least. But I also learned like how to treat other people, mm -hmm. and you know, not knocking my parents, but there. Were, I feel like a lot of times, parents in general, that's just like assume that 
your kid's supposed to is just going to get along with another kid but that's like assuming your dog is going to get along with another dog but we're more cautious about our dog our, yeah. our animals around other animals than we are our children or or just our, ourselves in general are around other people and we're always being influenced <clears throat> yeah not just by our parents but what we watch and, yeah, you exactly know, we, yeah you know and i i um i fill my time uh, my idle time with things that uh, that I perceive as good and, and that just because this person is different from me doesn't mean that they don't have, you know, good things to add to the, you know, to the pot. Yeah. Um, learn lessons about like telling lies and, and the consequences that can come from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I, you know, I learned things like the truth also hurts sometimes you know yeah. <laughs> um, all these values yeah. you can take away from definitely you know something and, that seems simple or taken for granted we yeah. don't think about yeah and i you know i didn't uh, after watching so much superhero stuff especially things like spider-man uh i feel like you're on a spider-man kick recently, <laughs> yeah that's for sure um yeah, well it's just fun because uh i see the the, the relation between like the him him and and just or just his life and then an artist in general i have all these people that want to hang out and and um you want my attention and want me to devote you know some time some sort of time to them um but i also have the art you know i'm called to do this art that requires the majority of my time and so where I distribute my time matters. So anytime art calls, it's like a disturbance in a spot in the Spider-Man world. Yeah. Because then you think about his relationships. He, he's always showing up late to yeah. Mary, Mary Jane's pissed off. And then he, he has like this other girl, Felicia, you know, and and, you know, and he'll run into her, at, you know, and and then he'll plan these these dates and then like. You know, the mom before he can even get there, like you know, his spidey senses are going off, and yeah. and then he's got to do something. In fact, he's like saving the girl that he planned to have a date with, and then yeah. and then and then he you know disappears, changes his outfit, come back, and it's like what happened, you know? And, yeah. and she's pissed off that he wasn't there, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but you know, or that he was late. And but, the life of Ken Ferguson. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so I have one last question for Ken, and that's in the city. If you were given a blank wall to create a mural, to create whatever message or whatever you wanted, what would it look like? Hmm. Um, well, I've always wanted to create positive things that bring, that inspire people to like come together. Uh, so like, I'd, I'd have to say, uh, I'd have to say I, I need to create something, uh, uh, that inspires you know love but like true love um like um real love it's love is a action word you know a verb and and it's about doing about serving i you know more so than just like doing things and not the i feel like the the word love has been uh, diluted, you know, we say, I love pizza, I love <laughs> this, I love that, you know, um, and we love everything. So then how does one know the difference <laughs> of mm-hmm. what you mean when you're saying that to another human being, when you say that to every human being, you say it to your best friend, yeah. you know, um, um, so you know, I, I think real love is like the, the doing and the serving and like the humbling of like one, um, to you know to do things for people or not do things to people but for them Mm -hmm. um especially if they ask um or because you know because you care um and so if i could create an image that kind of embodied that subject matter as a whole um that's that's what i would have to so love 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 in a like a genuine genuine love yeah and expressing Mm -hmm. expressing that to probably you could apply it to yourself to friends Mm -hmm. to significant others to the community to the world yeah Yeah. it's like untainted love you know um um a lot of things i mean like i said the word love has been diluted 
over the over the over the year many years that it's been used you know especially in western civilization you know um and those are love and hate are such strong words where we use them so lightly and and for everything i hate i hate broccoli yeah uh, i love pizza uh you know yeah uh, all that stuff you know but um um but what I want to encompass is like the true meaning of it, you know. Um, that's not sexual. That's not um, very overused. It's like real. Yeah, not matter of fact. Yeah, it's just like real, undeniable. You know that this person, these like I mean, this is how community community should operate. At the end of the day, anyway, you know, they, it's said that it takes a village to raise a kid, well, and that is very well true. Um, the problem is that the village is not so open anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, it's like, well, in order to have a village, I have to create a village, you know. But your village starts where you, where you, you know, with your neighbors, mm-hmm. then goes and goes outward. You know, my neighbors. Your village starts with wherever you want it to be or where yeah. you're committing it to. Definitely, you yeah. know. Um, whether it be business or or raising a family, um, you know, having eyes, true eyes, not, not surveillance, but like mm-hmm. just, you know, people looking out for your best interest as a kid and stuff like that. Uh, my neighbors knew me and my brothers and stuff like that and if I was doing something that they knew my parents wouldn't approve of they would confront me and and, you know tell me that you know if I don't stop they're gonna tell my parents you know all that kind of stuff you know people hate that kind of stuff now uh, but that's what's needed to keep people in check but that is love (laughs) you know they don't have it they have zero obligation to um, stop me from doing what I'm doing or else they tell my parents, you know, yeah. but they doing it out of respect and love for my parents. And, and, you know, most likely they have kids of their own that, you know, they like so this know, whole community. Right. Yeah. So the authenticity of family and community, you know, is, is a part of love. And, but in order for it to be authentic, you, everyone has to be willing to work collectively to make it authentic. People helping other people. It's what actually makes the world go yeah. around. Yes. Well, this has been very delightful. Thanks for uh, stopping by my bedroom. Cool, man. Well, you Appreciate know, it. I'm next door. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> so, All right. Thanks. Definitely. Thanks for listening to Rich Conversations. Again, you can follow Ken at KJ Ferg Art. Fill the rest of your day with an understanding that art surrounds us wherever we are. And it's always telling us something. So what is it telling you?